Good afternoon. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the webinar, WFH Treatment Guidelines, Practical Application in the Middle East. I'm Alok Srivastav from the Christian Medical College, Bellore in India, and it's my pleasure to chair this webinar. In the next slide, what you see is our agenda. Over the next 90 minutes, we will talk about different aspects of management of hemophilia and how they link with the treatment guidelines. It's meant to be an interactive session, so you will have a lot of opportunity to question and comment on the presentations. The first will discuss about prophylaxis and the second about surgery. So our speakers for today are very well known to you. Dr. Emna Goeda is Professor of Hematology at the Medical University of Tunis El Mar in Tunisia. She is the head of the Hemophilia Treatment Center at the Zaiza Othmana Hospital in Tunis. Dr. Magdi Elikiabi is a former member of the WFH board and he has been involved in the hemophilia community for many decades in Egypt. He is the vice president of the Egyptian Society for Hemophilia and works at the, as the head of the Blood Transfusion and Hemophilia Center at the Sabrawashi Hospital since 1983. Dr. Abdul Hakim Al-Rubas is a senior consultant in the Pediatric Hematology Oncology Unit, Child Health Department at the Sultan Qaboos University in Oman. He is well recognized in the field of pediatric hematology and oncology in the region. Cesar Haddad is a physiotherapist specialized in hemophilia care. He is responsible for the physiotherapy unit at the Lebanese Hemophilia Treatment Center for more than for a decade. Cesar is also the vice president of the World Federation of Hemophilia Musculoskeletal Committee. During this webinar, there will be simultaneous in translation into French and Arabic. The presentations, of course, will be in English, but you can choose either French or Arabic from the buttons shown to you to decide which language you want to listen to. If you are using your computer or tablet, please click on the interpretation button uh, shown on, on the right and select the language that you wish to listen in. If you're using a mobile phone, there are additional steps that you may need to do. We can move to the next slide, mobile phone. Yeah, thank you. Uh, the image on the left shows an Android phone. Click on the three dots at the bottom right to choose the interpretation channel, and then you can select the channel that you wish. If you don't click, on done, when your language selection is done, you will not, uh, you know, you will not be able to hear that language. So there are three steps, the three dots at the bottom, then you select language interpretation, then you choose the language and then say done. And with that, you should be able to listen in the language that you prefer. During today's webinar, as I mentioned earlier, you have the opportunity to ask written questions in the Q&A box. We will try to answer as many as possible, some immediately after the, the talk, and then we have about 20 minutes at the end for question and answer and discussion. So we will try and include as many of these questions as possible during this webinar. We encourage you also to put your comments in the chat box because they will be visible to the panelists as well as other participants. During this webinar, we will be using poll questions. When you see a poll question appear, you may select an answer and there may be more than one answer to these poll questions. Let me now start with a short presentation on the treatment guidelines, which will prepare the grounds for the next presentations. 
So it's been a great privilege for me to be associated with the treatment guidelines of the World Federation of Hemophilia from its first edition. What is shown in the next slide is of course my disclosures, but after that, what I wanted to share with you was the comments from Mike Macris and Carol Casper to the second edition. You know, uh, more than 15 years ago, when we started this journey with the first edition, this was essentially what I mentioned to the board. The principles of management of hemophilia, regardless of the resources you have, are the same everywhere in the world. And therefore, we can write a set of guidelines that will apply for everything except the dosage of the replacement therapy in those days that we used. And that was the basis of structuring these uh, guidelines. Why is that relevant? This is the only set of guidelines that I'm aware of in the world that applies everywhere. It doesn't matter whether you are in a highly resourced or a less resourced country. The only difference will be in the quantity of products that you use, but there are many other aspects of management which will be the same. The second purpose of these guidelines was to show that practice is not always based on high evidence and therefore it opens up opportunities for research. And that is something that we should try and do to create more evidence. And it gives opportunity for people to think about those areas and collaborate to produce the evidence. In the next slide, what is shown is the, the lead authors who uh, prepared the third edition of the management guidelines. But it's very important to mention that there were more than 50 people involved, many more healthcare professionals, as well as people with hemophilia and their family who were involved, led by some very wonderful professional staff of the World Federation of Hemophilia. So all these people together in the next slide, what you see is produce these 12 chapters. Now, the ones which are marked in red are the ones which are new in the third edition from the second edition. So we added a few new chapters, uh, one on principles of care, which I'll describe in some more detail. The expanding need for genetic assessment has uh, you know, been recognized. And the fact that genetic testing is much more widely and easily available to many people, you know, it was important that its role in routine management be mentioned. We have now finally made a very strong statement here that prophylaxis is the only way to treat hemophilia. Episodic treatment will take care of that bleed, but it will not change the natural history of this condition. And that's a very bold and delayed statement that's made in the sixth chapter. We then added a chapter on inhibitors, which was not there earlier, because we know how significant this has become in the management of patients. A very important aspect of hemophilia management is assessment of outcome. And this is something that has been neglected in many ways all around the world, even in well-resourced countries. We've been talking about this within the World Federation and other forum for the last 10 years at least. And this time we included a chapter on outcome assessment. Now, all this had to be done in an unbiased manner. We had to make these guidelines as evidence-based as possible and show that the methodology and the process was unbiased. So for the sake of those who want to understand how these guidelines were prepared, what were the methods followed, there's actually a chapter describing all that. So at the end, what happened is that the about 140 odd recommendations that we had in the second edition turned into about 338 practice recommendations, a major enhancement from the second edition. In the next slide, what you see is the chapter on principles of care. Now, in many places in the world, in fact, even in, in countries that have well-established hemophilia care, it's never ideal. So this is the pursuit of ideal. What do we want to be better? And how do we start? So what this does, you know, it has five items listed on the left side, which talk about organization of care who actually supports it, how should it be organized so that patients can access it without difficulty. And that's what is described in those five topics, the national coordination, the, the, the acquisition of products and its distribution, the laboratory services for diagnosis, education and training, particularly in the low and middle income countries, 
And then of course, the need for continued knowledge generation. And then what you see on the right side are all the details of how to actually manage individuals or cohorts of patients and what needs to be done right from diagnosis to outcome assessment through different forms of therapy. Now, a very important aspect that got added. So we had two principles of care described earlier, one from Europe, one from Asia Pacific. And, these, and this chapter has borrowed a lot from those two. But a very unique feature of this uh, principles of care is the patient empowerment. And we'll talk more about that later. In the next slide, it just tells you how should comp you know, the treatment centers be organized? When a country, when a government wants to organize a treatment center, what should it provide? This was something that was not so well defined within the WFH literature, and this time we have done that. In the next slide, what you see is the concept of patient empowerment. This will be discussed a little further by Dr. Magdi, and therefore I will skip this, but this is very important. In any chronic disease, particularly something like hemophilia, it's very important that patients have as much knowledge almost as a treating physician in terms of what is to be done and not done for him. And then in the next slide, uh, I'd like to conclude that the core messages from the third edition, particularly from the low and middle income country perspective, is that we have a major challenge in diagnosis. A lot of patients have not been detected. We have newer therapeutic options, but access needs to be established. But the most important message, as I said earlier, the only way to treat hemophilia is by prophylaxis, even starting at lower dosage, and you will hear a presentation about that. Uh, but the final goal must be the same everywhere, complete prevention of spontaneous bleeding with all normal activities. We have emphasized the sanitation of musculoskeletal management, as well as outcome assessment, and the need for continued clinical research. So with that, I will stop. And it's my great pleasure to invite uh, Dr. Emna Goida for her presentation. Kindly mute your microphones. Thank you. Thank you, Locke. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to be here in this webinar and I would like to thank the World Federation of Hemophilia for organizing this webinar. So uh, through a clinical case, we will try to see how to practice and to apply the WVRS and WFH treatment guideline. Next slide, please. So I have no disclosure. Next one. So we will uh, see together uh, a case of a two years old boy uh, with no family history with bleeding disorders. And uh, in September 2016, when he was one year old, the diagnosis of severe hemophilia A was set up uh, and he started with the replacement therapy. So uh, he received, uh, next please. So he received the first replacement therapy on diagnosis after uh, a post-traumatic lift. Uh, then a second uh, replacement therapy for uh, one hematoma developed after vaccination and two additional uh, replacement therapy for the same ankle hematrosis. So after that, I will ask all uh, the attendees uh, to answer to this poll. There is no right answer, there is no wrong answer, but we just want to know what, uh, what is your practice. So in your practice and context, what are you able to perform? You can select uh, one uh, proposition all all, uh, all, all more. So are you going to continue on episodic treatment with plasma derived factor eight or implementing a low dose prophylaxis with plasma derived factor eight or a full dose prophylaxis with recombinant factor eight or intermediate dose prophylaxis with extended half-life products? And are you going to screen for inhibitor? Please answer.
So here is your answers. 12% uh, will continue with replacement therapy on episodic uh, treatment. So it's great to see that 44% will start with low dose prophylaxis, 28% with full dose prophylaxis and recombinant factor A, 20% with intermediate dose prophylaxis with extended half-life, and 40% will screen for inhibitors. Okay, let's see together the different proposition. The first one was to continue on episodic treatment with plasma-derived factor VIII. What says the WFH guidelines? Next one, please. So in uh, the chapter number six on prophylaxis, there is a recommendation that says that for patients with severe phenotype hemophilia A or B, in countries with healthcare constraints, the WFH still strongly recommends prophylaxis even when the only option is using lower factor doses over episodic factor therapy to reduce hematrosis and other spontaneous and breakthrough bleeding and better preserve joint function. On another chapter, next, on another chapter on hemostatic agents, the WFH does not express a preference for recombinant over plasma derived clotic factor concentrate. And the choice between these classes of products must be made according to local criteria, including availability, costs, and patient preferences. So this is for the first proposition. What about low-dose prophylaxis, full dose or intermediate with plasma derived factor eight recombinant or extended half-life product? Next one. So again, in the chapter for prophylaxis and uh, in line uh, with what uh, was said just in the previous recommendation, for pediatric patients with severe hemophilia A and B, WFH recommends early initiation of prophylaxis with clotting factor concentrate, standard or extended half-life, or other hemostatic agents prior to the onset of joint disease and ideally before age three, in order to prevent spontaneous and breakthrough bleeding, including hematrosis, which can lead to joint disease. You have also a discussion on health economics on prophylaxis, but I will not go through it now. Next, please. In another recommendation, and. Uh, so for severe phenotype hemophilia A or B, especially children, the WFH recommends regular long-term prophylaxis as the standard of care to prevent hematrosis and other spontaneous and breakthrough bleeding, maintain musculoskeletal health, and promote quality of life. When prophylaxis is not feasible, Episodic therapy is essential treatment for acute hemorrhage, but it will not prevent long-term joint damage. Next, please. So prophylaxis using clotting factor concentrate. We must know that all forms of prophylaxis, high, intermediate, or low dose with clotting factor concentrate or prophylaxis with a non-factor replacement agent, such as mesizumab, will provide superior benefits over episodic therapy. Conventional high dose and intermediate dose prophylaxis initiated early in life have been associated with over 90% reduction in joint bleeding rates, annual joint, uh, annualized joint bleeding rates, below three per year, and a significant reduction in joint deterioration and degenerative joint disease. Next one. But although intensity of prophylaxis has generally been referred to as high or intermediate and low dose, 
it should be appreciated that the intensity is a function of both dose and frequency, and that high dose usually refers to a combination of both high dose and high frequencies, while low dose usually refers to a combination of lower doses and lower frequencies, although not always. So to summarize those recommendations, and as uh, Alok said in the beginning, the key messages, the whole key messages is that prophylaxis is the only way to treat people with hemophilia. And in order to implement prophylaxis, we need to have supply and access to safe replacement therapy. We need to have healthcare providers working in a multidisciplinary care, and also we need to develop the concept of hope treatment. What about screening for inhibitor, the last proposition of a poll? There is a chapter, the chapter number eight, on inhibitor to clotting factor concentrate, this big complication of treatment. And uh, it is critical to detect inhibitor early to ensure appropriate treatment. At least half of inhibitor cases are detected by routine inhibitor screening after initial exposure to clotting factor concentrate, while the rest are detected after there is a poor clinical response to replacement therapy uh, when treating or preventing a bleed. You have uh, a table summarizing the different indications for inhibitor screening in the guidelines. Next one, please. So one of the recommendations is that for patients with newly diagnosed hemophilia A, WFH recommends regular inhibitor screening at least every six, 12 months, and then annually. With the remark that in general, more frequent screening should be considered for recurrent bleeds or target joints that occur despite standard factor replacement. These recommendations place greater value on early inhibitor diagnosis in patients with severe hemophilia, and late diagnosis in adulthood in patients with less severe disease, such as after intensive exposure to clotting factor concentrate, for example, after surgery. And finally, the requirement for frequent blood draws was considered in relationship to the potential morbidity of uncontrolled or life threatening bleeds. For patients with hemophilia A who receive clotting factor concentrate for more than five consecutive days, WFH suggests inhibitor screening within four weeks of the last infusion. So what has been performed for our child? We started soon after uh, the first episode of uh, uh, bleeding in joint with a low dose regimen protocol with a once week injection of 1500 international unit of plasma derived factor eight corresponding to almost 30 international unit per kilo. So it was early prophylaxis, even if it is a low dose prophylaxis. So we are in line with the recommendation. We also advise knee protectors and inhibitor screening was performed after five exposures to clotting factor concentrate just before initiating prophylaxis. And uh, with the prophylaxis, no bleeding was observed. And inhibitor screening was performed after nine exposure and it was negative. But unfortunately, after 14 exposures, the results was positive, first with six uh, Bethesda units, and then 
14 Bethesda units. So the second poll, what are you going uh, to do based on the presentation? Are you going to treat bleeding events with plasma derived factor eight? Are you going to treat bleeding events with 7A, with recombinant factor 7A? Are you going to treat bleeding event with APCC, activated protrobin complex concentrates? Are you going to start with a high dose immune tolerance reduction or a low dose ITI? Please answer to the question. So this is your answers. The majority, 60%, will treat the bleeding events with uh, 7A. 70% will continue to treat with plasma-derived factor 8. And 70% will treat the events with APCC. And 70% will choose between high-dose ITI or low-dose ITI. So, Let's come back to the guidelines. Next slide, please. In the chapter for uh, inhibitors, there is a recommendation for patients with hemophilia A and inhibitors who have acute bleeds. WFH recommends factor eight concentrates for those with low responding inhibitors. And by pacing agent, 7A or APCC for those with high responding inhibitors. So uh, the table uh, number 83 summarizes this recommendation and monitoring for low uh, responding with factor A will be uh, the factor uh, ASA activity, whereas using uh, the bypassing agent the only option uh, that could be used for monitoring is thromboelastography or thrombin generation assay. Next one, please. For patients with hemophilia A who develop persistent low responding inhibitors, WFH suggests that immune tolerance reduction be considered. In uh, the same uh, way, for patients with hemophilia A and persistent inhibitors who fail ITI or never underwent ITI, WFH recommends emesizima prophylaxis over bypassing agent for prophylaxis as emesizumab is more effective in bleed prevention and simpler to administer as it is given weekly and subcutaneously. In the same way, the WFH recommends emesizumab over bypass agent prophylaxis to reduce bleeding episodes as emesizumab appears to be superior to bypass prophylaxis. So what has been performed in our, chil in our child? Bleeding events was treated with bypassing agent 7A and tranexamic acid. Prophylaxis was not discontinued, but we increases the dose and the frequency of the injection. And finally, it became a low dose RTI with monitoring of the inhibitor. Next one. So today, our child is six years old. Uh, he had received five years of ITI. The inhibitor dropped to one unit Bethesda after increasing doses of factor eight, but it is it's still here. He do not require now 7A for, bleed, for treating the bleeding event and factor eight is sufficient 
to, uh, to treat bleeding events. However, we still have some bleeding events and he is six years old, he is more active. His Hemophilia Jones Health Score increases to eight and the last ultrasound shows a thickness of the left elbow synovitis. Emesizumab, unfortunately, is not yet available in our country. It is still under registration and should be a good option for him. And the question to, to our expert is, do we need to continue with ITI with this child? With this, I will finish. And thank you for your attention. Well, uh, thank you very much, Emna, for uh, this very elaborative uh, presentation, which could clearly link uh, how can we manage our patients uh, using the, the guidelines uh, as a reference to our practice. And I could see also from uh, the answers is that the answers came uh, uh, variable in a way that probably represents the, the practice in the different uh, countries uh, because our region, as you know, is very diversified between countries with uh, relatively limited access to care uh, and others who have, uh, 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 I mean, uh, uh, enough resources to treat according to the high standard of care. So uh, with this, I, I would like also to uh, welcome uh, my uh, co-moderator, uh, Dr. Cesar. Uh, Dr. Cesar, as uh, uh, Dr. Alok uh, referred, he is a physiotherapist, which is very important in our discussions uh, in, in this webinar. Uh, I have just a few comments. Uh, and uh, at, at first, I would like to thank Dr. Alok, who, who led this guidelines since, uh, since at least a decade uh, or more to, to, to see it in, in its different, uh, I mean, uh, uh, editions. And with the last edition, which is really comprehensive and has been done in a highly uh, professional way, despite uh, the limitations of the uh, resources uh, due to the rarity of the disease. But one of the points that Dr. Alec highlighted was the patient empowerment. And the, he listed the points uh, of the importance of the patient empowerment. And again, I would like to emphasize this, that when patients know about their disease and they can respond to the different uh, uh, problems of the disease when it happens at the time of its happening, this will uh, uh, greatly improve the outcome of uh, his management. Uh, because, I mean, with hemophilia, we have a lifelong journey. The better we know, the better we are empowered to seek the advice or to implement the right uh, intervention at the right time will greatly improve the quality of life, not only for the patient, but as well for his uh, family and the surrounding community. At uh, Dr. Emna's uh, uh, presentation, uh, I would like to emphasize that yes, the, 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 the prophylaxis, even the low-dose prophylaxis is now the gold standard, but we need also always to remember that this has to happen within a comprehensive care environment that can look at the different needs of the patient and particularly when we practice the low-dose prophylaxis, we expect that probably we will see some more frequent bleeding uh, compared to the higher standard. And the earlier we can manage the complications of the bleeding, such as when the uh, boy develops uh, uh, starting arthropathy, how can we treat this? When do we interfere if we would like to deactivate the synovium? And I think there were uh, recommendations uh, about this in the management section uh, of the complications in the guidelines where it emphasizes the uh, uh, synovial deactivation, whether by radioactive intervention or chemical intervention. And also uh, the, the, the importance of pain management in these situations and what should the patient receive as a pain management. And then I will hand over to uh, Cesar to tell us about the role of physiotherapy as well 
in, in, in this comprehensive care environment in low dose prophylaxis. Cesar, please. Uh, thank you, Dr. Magdi. Thank you, Dr. Emna, also for the nice presentation and nice case, and uh, Dr. Alok for leading this session. Uh, I would like to highlight uh, when I started working with hemophilia care, uh, the patients, they have uh, fear of movement. They were very afraid uh, to move their joints. And it was very difficult for uh, the, us uh, in the Lebanese Association for Hemophilia to introduce a physiotherapy dedicated uh, unit. Uh, so patients can see how important uh, this uh, physiotherapy to protect the joint, to build stronger muscles, and it is considered as a low cost. If we, if we want to consider the cost of the uh, treatment medication for a patient with hemophilia, it's high cost for this, uh, and uh, it doesn't... Uh, uh, it doesn't, uh, as you have seen with Dr. Emna, even with people who has access to uh, prophylactic treatment, they still uh, have, uh, they have 90% uh, uh, decrease in the joint bleeding rate, but there is still, even in the high uh, societies that have access to clotting factor, they still have um, uh, joint bleedings. So as a physiotherapy uh, uh, perspective, uh, we must uh, be able to detect early symptoms and uh, even sometimes there is some uh, silent symptoms that we cannot uh, see every day. So it's very important and based on the guidelines of the World Federation of Hemophilia, uh, uh, patients that are uh, under 12 years old, they must be assessed at least uh, twice per year and uh, uh, other patient must be assessed once per year. Uh, this is for assessment. And if there is any uh, problem in their joints, this problem must be worked on uh, based on uh, the situation for every patient. So uh, a proper uh, physiotherapy assessment is primordial for a patient with hemophilia in addition to the uh, follow-up with the hematologist and uh, this is the role of hematologists to prescribe physiotherapy because our mentality in the region uh, do not, uh, we only like to give clotting factor and uh, bring our patient back home. And uh, we don't have the resilience to pursue a physiotherapy session. So it's very important. One of the most important aspects in the follow-up a patient with hemophilia to highlight on uh, because it is not only cost effective uh, but also it uh, gives a good quality of life for the patient with hemophilia. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, thank, you, thank you very much. Martin. I think. Thank you, Cesar. Yes. Uh, yeah, uh, there's a question here uh, that you know we have probably a minute or two in this session. There's an important question for Emna. Um, mm -hmm. It says, your patient had 14 Bethesda units. Was it necessary to continue prophylaxis during ITI? Ah, yes. It's, ITI is a kind of prophylaxis, but it is not prophylaxis. ITI is, uh, is the induction of, uh, of uh, tolerization, uh, immune tolerization. The, the principle is to continue to give uh, big doses of factor VIII in order to try to neutralize and to disappear the inhibitor. So it is not prophylaxis. For, uh, for, the, child, for, for the child and the parents, we explain this and uh, I put prophylaxis uh, between uh, two gear me because, because it is not prophylaxis, it is ITI. It is ITI and the purpose is to try to eradicate the inhibitors and today it is the only curative treatment, only curative treatment to, to try to eradicate the inhibitors. Even if you have new products for prophylaxis, the treatment, the real treatment is to eradicate the inhibitors. Inhibitors. And the better way is to start as early as possible. So that's why it's important to screen for inhibitor. That's why it's important to identify early the inhibitors in order to have more chance for success of the ITI. 
Okay, there are a few more questions, but we'll come back to them during the um, question and answer session at the end. Uh, so we will move on now to the next presentation, which will be done by Dr. Abdul Hakim Al Rawaz, and he will present a surgical case. Thank you, Dr. Al Rawaz. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Dr. Alok, for the introduction. I would like to thank the WFH for uh, organizing this webinar and special thanks to Rana for giving me uh, the opportunity to uh, share uh, this case uh, with you. I'll be presenting an orthopedic surgery in pediatric hemophilia patient with uh, inhibitor. Next slide, please. These are my uh, disclosures. Uh, next slide, please. So our case is an eight years old uh, boy with severe uh, hemophilia A uh, with inhibitors. Uh, the family was reluctant to receive uh, immune tolerance induction. Therefore, he was placed on demand by passing agent factors uh, 7A, 270 mics per kg for home therapy for trauma. He developed chronic left hip uh, pain and limbing not associated with uh, heme arthrosis. He was seen by orthopedic and, um, and the imaging was done, which was uh, showing, a, uh, as you can see in the x-ray, a vascular uh, necrosis of the left femoral, uh, femoral head, uh, consistent with leg carp birthers disease. Next slide, please. The boy was diagnosed at uh, one month of age uh, through targeted screening, uh, family screening. His factor uh, eight level was less than 1% and the mutation analysis, analysis revealed intron 22 inversion. His first exposure to factor eight was around the age of uh, eight, uh, five months for uh, circumcision. And unfortunately around the, the age of 30 months, he developed high responding uh, uh, factor eight inhibitor after 11 exposure de uh, days. His peak effect uh, inhibitor SA was uh, 68 and niche region uh, Bethesda uh, units uh, per mm. The year of uh, the age, at the age of five years, it was tough for him. He had uh, acute abdomen with emergency appendectomy under the cover of factor eight, factor seven and uh, um, APCC. We had a shortage of factor seven, therefore he was switched to uh, activated thrombin complex. A month later, he presented uh, to the emergency with acute kidney, uh, kidney injury with uh, hematuria, bilateral uh, hydronephrosis, secondary to uretic uh, stone or clot. It was not clear whether there was a stone or a clot. He required cystoscopy and a bilateral stent insertion, which was done successfully under the cover of factor uh, 7A. Next slide. He had uh, one older sibling with severe hemophilia A and inhibitors and his physical examination revealed no joint swelling or deformity. However, his left hip uh, had limitation of the range of movements in internal rotation, abduction, and flexion. The range of movements in the other joints were within normal. Next slide, please. So the, he was planned for left proximal femur virus osteotomy. Let's go through what the uh, latest WFH guidelines or commands with regards to the, um, uh, the preparation uh, for surgery pertaining to our case. So the WFH recommends patient with hemophilia requiring surgery should be managed at or in consultation with a comprehensive hemophilia treatment center. Unfortunately, we did not have a pediatric uh, orthopedic surgeon. However, we consulted with our adult colleagues and communicated with a, a pediatric orthopedic uh, surgery in our uh, sister institution and convinced them to come and operate in our uh, institution. Another important recommendation is uh, that sufficient quantities of clotting factors concentrate must be available for the surgery and for the post-operative period as well. So when we consulted with our pharmacy, we had adequate factor eight and factor seven A. Um, we did not have uh, APCC and we had anti-fibrinolytic uh, um, uh, agents in the form of tranexamic acid. Next slide. With uh, regards to the laboratory support, the WFH recommends that center providing surgery for patients with hemophilia should have adequate laboratory support for reliable monitoring of clotting factor levels and uh, in the perioperative period. 
that was available in our institution. However, the turnaround time was uh, slightly longer than what, what we wish. Also, the WFH recommends pre and post operative inhibitor screening and have an inhibitor assay, which was done in our patient uh, uh, who had a, a, a negative uh, inhibitor um, detection preoperatively. Next slide, please. So that takes us to the poll question. Um, in your practice and context, what would you be your choice of homeostatic therapy? Bypassing agent alone, bypassing agent plus tranexamic acid, factor eight, or factor eight plus that tranexamic acid? Please answer. Okay, so the majority of the, 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 the responders are uh, planning for bypassing agent plus tranexamic acid. So let's see what the uh, WFH uh, guidelines um, recommends. So next slide, please. So in chapter eight, inhibitor and clotting factor in the uh, latest uh, or the, uh, the third edition of the WFH uh, guidelines, with regards to perioperative uh, management uh, with a uh, hemostatic agent, for patient with hemophilia A and high responding factor uh, 8 inhibitor who undergo surgery or invasive procedure, the WFH recommends bypass agent therapy, either recombinant factor 8, uh, factor 7, or um, uh, APCC at the discretion of the clinician. And for patients who are receiving imicizumab, who are undergoing major uh, surgery or an invasive procedure, the WFH recommends factor eight containing product for those with low responding inhibitors. However, for patients with high responding uh, inhibitors, the WFH recommends a recombinant factor 7A over APCC due to the risk of thrombo, uh, thrombotic microangiopathy. Next slide. With regards to uh, monitoring for patient with hemophilia A and inhibitors who are using bypassing agent therapy, the WFH recommends clinical monitoring and consideration of laboratory monitoring with thrombin generation and other uh, coagulation tests. We, um, uh, uh, we, unfortunately, we did not have the uh, thrombin generation test, but we used the clinical monitoring part uh, to assess our patients. With uh, regards to adjuvant uh, therapy uh, for patients with hemophilia undergoing surgery, an ant antifibrinolytic and topical hemostatic agent should be considered if auxiliary therapies are required beyond factor replacement. Let's go back to our patient. Next slide. So the patient was requiring a uh, plan for left proximal femur virus osteotomy. His preoperative inhibitor was not detected and he was planned for him uh, for factor 7A, 180 unit uh, microgram per kg preoperatively and then 90 microgram per kg every two hours for 48 hours. And according to his response, the factor uh, 7A uh, the duration would be uh, spaced. Next slide. As you can see in the picture, the patient went to the surgery. His intraoperative um, uh, hemostasis was excellent. There was no surgical drain inserted. But unfortunately, at day about uh, post op day two, the, the child started to have increasing pain with swelling in the left thigh. He had significant drop in his hemoglobin requiring blood transfusion and the pain was significant, requiring high dose of morphine at 50 mics per kg per hour. However, he did not have any neurovascular compromise. The working diagnosis at the time is impending compartment syndrome, 
and he was planned uh, for emergency surgery. Next slide, please. That takes us for our second poll question. So now based on this case and presentation, what would be your hemostatic therapy of choice at this point? Continue with factor 7a, switch to factor 8, give factor 7a with tranexamic acid, give factor uh, 8 with tranexamic acid, give factor 8, factor 7a, and tranexamic acid all together. Please answer. So I would say there is a split in answers. The majority would still give uh, add tranexamic acid at this point, but there are other around 30% um, would um, add factor eight and tranexamic acid uh, together. Let's see what would be the recommendation of the latest uh, WFH guidelines. Next slide. So the WFH recommends in patients with hemophilia A and high responding factor VIII inhibitor who is undergoing surgery. If a single agent bypass fails, sequential bypassing agent treatment factor 7A alternating with uh, APCC as uh, shown in, this, uh, in, the, in the table. So almost every six hourly uh, factor 7A and every six hourly at a dose of 90 mics per kg uh, per hour and a six hourly uh, APCC at a dose of 50 units per, per kg. Another recommendation for with regards to the compartment uh, syndrome is that in hemophilia patient with muscle bleed with evidence of com uh, compartment syndrome and neurovascular compromise, a fasciotomy is required within 12 hours uh, from the time of onset of symptoms before the irreversible damage sets in due to the tissue necrosis. Next slide, please. So our patient underwent uh, emergency fasciotomy. Uh, he had a hematoma evacuation and drain insertion. He was covered with factor eight, 48 hours. He had a post-infusion factor eight recovery, but did not come at the same time. It came out later to be 130%, which was a good uh, at uh, 50 units per kg uh, uh, dose. Um, however, his inhibitor level jumped at day 5 to 2.4 and at day 10 is 188. We continued with the recombinant uh, factor uh, 7 because we did not have readily available results of the recovery uh, test and we added the tranexamic acid. The patient bleeding was controlled, his drain was removed at 72 hours and the um, factor 7 um, um, intervals were increased gradually. Next slide. He was discharged at day 12 uh, from surgery. He was placed on prophylactic uh, factor 7a for uh, physiotherapy and we managed after cost analysis uh, to convince um, the uh, hospital administration to initiate him on emicizumab prophylaxis as per the WFH recommendation mentioned by Dr. Amna previously. His, the patient since has been doing well with no breakthrough bleeds and his last inhibitor levels is 130 uh, units per ml. Next slide. What are the uh, challenges and successes that we faced with this case? Uh, the first challenge was the unavailability of the uh, in-house in uh, orthopedic uh, surgeon, but we insisted to have the surgery in our institution and we managed to convince our orthopedic surgeon, pediatric orthopedic surgeon to come to our hospital to do the surgery. The availability of product, um, um, the uh, alternative 
bypassing agent was an, an, a risk that we didn't have alternative. However, the, the fact that his inhibitor was um, zero gave us a, a backup plan in case of we run into problem with the factor 7a. Laboratory support with regards to monitoring of uh, hemostasis. Uh, we did not have uh, thromboelastography or thrombin generation assays. However, we used uh, the clinical assessment to assess the hemostasis of the patient postoperatively. And we succeeded in seizing this opportunity and uh, doing cost analysis, uh, um, uh, comparing the uh, use of uh, the uh, by uh, agent versus uh, emicizumab, and we managed to convince the hospital to provide us to provide the patient with the uh, emicizumab prophylaxis. And with this, I and thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. King, for uh, uh, this is really uh, uh, an important experience. And uh, again, uh, referring to the guidelines on how to get ready uh, in very difficult situations, such as this situation, uh, and how can the guidelines help us in setting the scene to perform such uh, complicated uh, surgeries. Uh, I have one question for you. Uh, I mean, uh, since this boy was, uh, was for a very long period on uh, uh, non-factory replacement therapy uh, that he probably, uh, and with the history of the inhibitors, that the inhibitors might have uh, dropped. Uh, did, you, did you think of uh, uh, doing the uh, factor eight recovery assays at the very beginning uh, that uh, it may prove that this is a, a high responder inhibitor, the, although the, the Bethesda uh, units may be very low in the beginning? or he, uh, that he, uh, uh, I mean, cured his uh, uh, inhibitor problem. And the, at this case, we can use the factory replacement. Not specifically in this uh, situation, but uh, as a general uh, uh, practice. Yes, he was actually, I probably had to cut because of the limitation of slides. He was yeah. challenged uh, previously and he had an amnestic reaction. So the, that the proof that he had um, the um, um, high responding inhibitor. So um, it was done before, not pertaining to the surgery, but previously we, we have tried him with factor eight and we did the recovery time and the inhibitor assay and he, uh, he had a meniscus reaction. And then after that, we ended up switching him back to, to uh, the bypassing agent. Therefore, we, we knew that this patient would re react to, to, uh, to the exposure of factor eight. So we wanted to save uh, the, the, the window that we may have since we did not have the, uh, the uh, APCC with us, we wanted to save the, 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 the window uh, in this particular time to give factor eight if needed um, um, if the patient did not control the bleeding. Okay, thank you very much for uh, this uh, answer because there was also another question regarding this uh, point, but I think you have answered it. Uh, now, uh, Cesar, would you like to comment? And do you have any experience, Cesar, in, in managing the Perthes disease from the point of uh, physiotherapy, uh, respective of the hemophilia? Um, I would like to uh, firstly emphasize on two points uh, that uh, Dr. Abdel Hakim has mentioned. Uh, it is very, uh, firstly, important uh, that uh, one of the challenges they have uh, faced is the importance of having a comprehensive treatment center for hemophilia. Uh, well, we usually have uh, different countries, uh, only a one-man show, one person doing everything for the patient, trying their best. Uh, usually they are the hematologist. But whenever uh, in countries uh, uh, who have comprehensive treatment center for hemophilia or uh, treatments that are able, uh, treatment centers that are able to coordinate together uh, that can be considered as a reference for the patients themselves, uh, this will facilitate the uh, access to treatment for these 
these patients. So uh, I would like to uh, emphasize about uh, this subject uh, for the different uh, countries uh, attending with us to as much as possible, uh, even a small uh, unit, uh, uh, we start with small steps and we grow further uh, into uh, this uh, to, to uh, better the, make uh, better the situation. Uh, a second point that I would like uh, to focus on is uh, concerning the treatment of such complicated case. As you have seen, uh, this case uh, has major uh, musculoskeletic complications, uh, either due to uh, hemophilia itself or uh, due to inherited problem, musculoskeletic uh, problems. So the main focus of such uh, cases and the follow-up uh, of such cases uh, will be uh, to have to make this patient as functional as possible, uh, to be able to preserve their quality of life and uh, to be able to provide him with a proper, uh, the surgery is uh, one part, but most often the patient look at the surgery as if it was the uh, only solution or the only uh, salvation for them. But we must focus also not only on a treatment factor and uh, uh, the uh, operation surgical procedure itself, but also the follow up of such case is very important to help this patient uh, uh, continue uh, living their lives independently, decently, having their own, uh, uh, having their uh, abilities explored uh, as much as possible. So these are the two major points that I would like to uh, highlight. And thank you, of course, uh, Dr. Abdel Hakim, for the case. Okay, thank you. I will. Uh, there are like two questions that came in Arabic, and uh, they are uh, uh, general questions. So I will uh, I will not direct it to any one of the speakers, anyone who would like to answer this. So the first question came is: uh, Can him libra have a positive effect in treating damaged and stiff joints? due to bleeding from previous years? So Dr. Magdi, may I uh, make a comment on the surgical case uh, that yes, Dr. Abdul Hakim has, and then we'll go to that. So yeah. first I want to congratulate Dr. Abdul Hakim because you know, it's not easy anywhere in the world performing uh, surgeries on patients with uh, you know, high responding inhibitors. So congratulations. Uh, you mentioned that you, know, you don't have thrombin generation assay, and therefore that's a like limitation. But you also uh, showed the WFH guideline, which says that the latter needs more data. So I just wanted to make a comment that even if you have a thrombin generation assay, uh, you know, there isn't enough evidence of what parameters you would use to decide that you are achieving good clinical hemostasis. And that's the challenge in this game that, you know, a lot of it is clinical. You use standard dosage. Uh, sometimes we even get away with lower dosage, even when patients with inhibitors and bypass agents. Uh, thrombin generation may give you some kind of uh, reassurance, but there is lack of data on what thrombin generation parameters will correlate with assured clinical hemostasis. Yeah, sorry, okay. So, um, you know, Dr. Magdi, maybe we will, uh, we are just in time for this uh, session as well. So actually that takes us now very nicely to the question and answer session. So maybe uh, I will, uh, you know, go back to the translation from Arabic that Dr. Magdi did for the general two questions. And it was about uh, the effect of Himlebra on already damaged joints. Is that right, Dr. Mati? Yes, yes, correct. Yes. Okay, so which one of the panelists would like to comment on that? It's a general question, more from a prophylaxis perspective, I guess. So maybe, maybe Emna. <clears throat> There was no, yeah, yeah. I have no, no. no thank you a lot. I have no experience with the sure, sure, Libra. Um, whereas I don't think that when we have damages with uh, uh, 
with the, the, the available now products, we can, we can remove the damages. Uh, at least we can stop the evolution maybe, but I don't think that we can, uh, we can remove damages with uh, any product. Will anyone else like to make a comment on that? Uh, so well, if me, I may comment, yeah, because yes, yes, there's yes, a yes, problem yes. Uh, of the joints, <laughs> it's something that uh, uh, I deal with uh, a lot. I know that yes. it's very important, the prophylaxis, and uh, even with the Hem Libra itself, it's a new uh, technology or a new uh, generation of treatment. Uh, but uh, as Dr. Emna was saying, the joints, whenever they are, the deterioration has started, so it depends on the level of deterioration. Whenever this deterioration has started, it will be uh, difficult to uh, regain uh, the cartilage that has been already uh, damaged. Uh, what we can do is through using the prophylaxis uh, prophylaxi treatment, uh, either with different product, whatever the product is, uh, we can help reduce or slow down the uh, destruction of the joint itself. So uh, instead of uh, that this joint will, will last with us, for example, for the next 20 years, uh, with the proper prophylaxis and proper follow-up as a physiotherapy, reinforcement muscle, uh, proper uh, functional follow-up, this uh, uh, joint will be able to last even mo few more years in advance. So uh, it doesn't matter, uh, uh, it, it doesn't affect the cartilage uh, itself, but it will help reduce the uh, a uh, number of bleed preserves the joint for a longer time. Thank you, Cesar. In fact, you know, there is a little bit of data around this. From the time when the long-acting products started becoming available uh, and the, uh, you know, people were maintaining higher than 1%, what that cohort was shown, and this data was presented in several meetings, that for the first time they could show the HJHS, the Hemophilia Joint Health Score, improving over two, three, four years in these patients. Now, how does that happen? Well, the soft tissue component definitely can improve if you have not had bleed for years, as Cesar just pointed out. Now, whether cartilage will approve, I wish they had taken some MRIs to see whether cartilage, cartilage repair can happen depending on how advanced the cartilage damage is. So I think these are important, you know, considerations, but we don't have too much data. Okay, so we have several more questions. Let's go back to the first one waiting for a while now. And that's for Emna. What is the minimum effective dose of prophylaxis in hemophilia A? Short answer, Emna, please, because it's a difficult question. Depending, <laughs> yes, it's very difficult. And I will answer depending on your condition and in your objectives. Uh, for example, um, Catherine Lambert in, uh, in uh, Ivory Coast uh, published recently in 25 children with low-dose prophylaxis with a once-week injection of factor 8 and an injection every 10, uh, 10 days for factor 9. So it depends on the condition, but let's say between 10 to 50 units per injection is the minimum. And then we have also the frequency depending on the access and your condition, home therapy and so on. Thank you. The next question that came up here that I can see is, can we use emisuzumab at lower dosage or at longer periods? One milligram per kg every 10 days. Okay, anybody wants to take that one? Well, uh, uh, I, uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I do not have accurate data, but I know that the Himlebra is starting to be used in our country. And I think that in the centers using it, they are using currently at a little bit lower doses. How this will reflect, we are not sure yet, but generally they are doing this. Yes. Uh, Dr. Abdul Rahim, do you want to make any comment? Are you using other than this patient with uh, inhibitors? Uh, no, actually, we are using for this family together. Oh, like, okay. 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 So. But, uh, you know, I have no experience with lower dosing. I mean, it would be interesting to see uh, how it would reflect in terms of... So, so you know, we, 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 have, we have good theoretical reason to do it. And let me explain very quickly. You know, in the full dose Himlebra, him, him we are achieving 
the hemostasis is equivalent to about 10 to 15 percent at least of factor VIII. So the question all of us may want to ask, and many of our participants today may ask, do I really want 10 to 15 percent? Can I not live with five? And that's really the answer. So here, actually, in India, you know, Hemlibra is available uh, to us, and some people are using. And we are, you know, several children are on one milligram to 1.5 every two weeks instead of every week. In fact, there are some who are even taking it once a month in the beginning. So anything in that range seems to be giving, but you know, the follow-up is short. So we have to be careful how we interpret this data. But it was known that when it becomes available in the market, uh, many people in many parts of the world may not want to be able to or need to chase 10 to 15%. Yeah, look, I, I just want to, to, to explain to the people why this can theoretically be valid because in this, the, the hemlebra is an, uh, is an immunoglobulin or uh, an antibody. And the normal half-life of the antibody is 28 days. So if we, like what we do for the primary immunodeficiency, we load our patients to reach above a critical level and, and we follow them up for a period of time to see if they do not go down below the trough level. So this can be a valid uh, uh, way to do it as well, is to follow up uh, uh, if we are able in the future to have a specific assay for the uh, antibody itself, uh, and it's correlated with the level of hemostasis, we'll be able to have a scientific answer to this uh, question problem. Yeah, thank you. So um, this is a question to Dr. Cesar. I am 37 years old and I'm suffering of limited movement in the most of my major joints, could physical therapy benefit to regain movement? Cesar. Well, uh, I think, um, uh, of course, physiotherapy is uh, important. It can help uh, to uh, regain the functional abilities. Uh, usually in this case, whenever the uh, joint uh, is uh, already uh, at a certain level of uh, uh, this destruction, um, uh, there will be a, a little bit of difficulty to regain the range of motion itself. It depends on the situation, uh, but we can uh, uh, work on reducing the stiffness in the surrounding of the muscle. We can uh, try to reduce the inflammation uh, as well as the number of bleeds. And uh, with time, uh, the treatment plan is to regain the functional abilities of this patient as much as possible. So, of course, uh, physiotherapy, but, but the problem is it needs uh, persistence. It doesn't, it's not like that uh, a magic something. It needs persistence. So one has to do uh, regular uh, sessions. Uh, of course, if available uh, with prophylaxis, if not available prophylactic treatment, it will be uh, uh, the, the intensity of the session will be uh, lower, a little bit lower, but there still uh, can, uh, we still can have a lot of work to do. Thank you. A question now about switching clotting factors. So using different types of clotting factors, does it add to the risk of inhibitors? Dr. Abdul Hakim, you want to take that one? So uh, the the um, no if you point. use multiple, you know, in 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 one year the country buys Factor X and in another year they buy another product. All Factor Eight may be, you know, but different products. If you switch products, does it increase the risk of inhibitors? That's the question. So theoretically, yes. If you do it, if you if you if you there is maybe if you do it frequently. However. Uh, the studies showed that with, with like, especially coming out from UK with the tenders and switching product based on, on, on tender has not increased the inhibitor. Uh, Absolutely. However, if you keep switching between uh, visits, then that is different uh, story. That is not, uh, 
Yeah, really, there's no data that uh, switching between the usual products makes a difference uh, so far. Absolutely. Okay. Um, what are the questions? Uh, Dr. Magdi or the, uh, Cesar, have you found anything that we need to take up? Uh, there's one about the WFH guidelines. I'll take it at the end. Uh, there are a few okay. questions in the chat box. If you look okay. to the chat box, please. Go the ahead. question uh, are, are there, yeah, are there the question on which one? Uh, on rifampicin, yeah. The role yeah. of rifampicin injection in hemophilic joint. Uh, maybe, uh, Cesar, so it's, we're talking about synovia thesis. And do you want to just comment on the use of rifampicin versus other agents? Yes, um, rifampicin uh, is considered as a chemical cyanovectomy. Cyanovectomy procedure is made whenever there is an inflammation, there is a repeated bleed and inflammation in the synovial membrane causing this repetitive joint uh, bleedings. Uh, and to prevent these bleedings, we need to intervene uh, with uh, some kind of procedure that is able to uh, reduce the amount of uh, inflammation and bleeding itself. So there is uh, the chemical synovectomy, there is the radioactive synovectomy, both are considered not very invasive uh, like operational procedures. Um, so it's depending on the availability and it depends on the country. Rifampicin itself uh, is considered to be uh, a good intervention for uh, such uh, uh, repetitive, but the problem of rifampicin is that it is uh, it, it produces a little pain more than the radioactive synovectomy and it needs uh, five to six times repetition with one week uh, difference, time difference between each injection. Uh, the, res the results, uh, as it has been shown, is good. Uh, in Lebanon, we don't have the uh, chemical synovectomy, which the rifampicin is considered. What we use in Lebanon is the radioactive uh, synovectomy, which can be considered uh, and only uh, one dose is needed and a low, lower uh, level of pain uh, from the uh, rifampicin injection. Absolutely, thank you. Yeah, actually the rifampicin literature is really quite old now, mostly from Dr. Palazzi from South America, Venezuela, you know, many years ago. So if, if possible, you would like to avoid it because of all the reasons that Cesar just mentioned. Uh, okay. Um, yeah, there's somebody who wants to comment uh, on rifampicin. Uh, is that Dr. Mahmood? Uh, is, that, is that possible? Uh, Alia, uh, Dr. Mahmood Aburiyash, he wants to comment on rifampicin therapy. Maybe he has some experience. Alia, is that possible for Dr. Mahmoud to... Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, we can hear you very well. Go ahead. Assalamu alaikum. Go ahead. Uh, thank you for uh, everyone. Thank you for uh, Rana and for this very interesting uh, uh, event session. Uh, I would like to comment from my experience in King, uh, King Faisal Specialist Hospital and Research Center about using of Rifampicin and uh, treating, uh, treating uh, the uh, arthropathy. Actually, it's we, we tried this in, in a couple of patients, um, but uh, unfortunately, it is uh, very painful. Yes. You have to do it uh, uh, several times. You have to use also uh, factor uh, factor replacement as. My uh, colleague Cesar said it's chemical cytovectomy, but uh, as you know, now we are using the uh, radioactive isotopes in treating uh, chronic arthropathy, uh, which is having an, an excellent result in our area, or very, let me say, very good result. We reach up to 74% of improvement in the joints in terms of uh, episodes of bleeding, uh, range of movement improved, uh, as well as the uh, um, the rate of movement, the uh, the pain itself reduced from eight 
some of them to zero, some of them to, to two. And one of the patient, he told me, Mahmoud, I used to uh, walk only 200 meters per day. He's a banker. And now I'm okay. for four, four kilometers per day. Terrific. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mahmoud. So uh, we will move to uh, a question here. Is Himlibra superior to recombinant 7A in patients with high data inhibitors with frequent bleeding? Um, any one of the panelists would like to take that? For prophylaxis? Yes. The question is for prophylaxis. Yes, prophylaxis. The question, I yeah, think I answered to the, I answered to the question already in the presentations, yes? yes. And according to the World Federation uh, guidelines, if we need prophylaxis for uh, people with hemophilia, a, uh, who have inhibitor and who didn't respond to ITI or who didn't uh, underwent ITI, emicizumab is uh, better uh, than uh, bypassing agent for prophylaxis. Yeah, you know, I mean, it's better by miles. You know, when, if you look at the data, yeah, even people with inhibitors, 60, 70% of them get zero bleeds. So that's, exactly. you know, that actually gets a new, new way to assess efficacy not just by reduction in bleed, but what percent of patients have zero bleeds, ABR, you know, the annual bleed rate. Okay, there's a question here on, um, are the publications specific to one country in the region where recommendation of WFH can be relied or taken into account the actual situation available in these countries? So I guess what Dr. Taufik is asking from Tunisia, is, are they country specific? He's oh, the, okay. president of, the president of the NMO. Oh, okay, good. So I guess, you know, the answer to this is that the, the guidelines have been designed for general application all over the world, as I said earlier. But we also recognize that countries may want to modify, adapt, and adopt their modifications which would be acceptable to their ministries of health. So Australia is one example of doing that very formally. With the second edition, they took the permission of the WFH, modified it, and then got it accepted by their government. They're doing that right now with the third edition. We know that Germany also reviewed it seriously. So I think, you know, the question is very uh, reasonable. Uh, you can you know, review it within your Ministry of Health and the experts there and the patients and decide that, okay, you know, WFH gives too many options in certain situations. You will decide that in your country at this point in time, this is what you will follow and everybody will do that. So I think that possibility exists. Emna, you want to comment? No, it's perfect what we said and we, <laughs> we discussed on that with, uh, with Taufiq. Very good. Okay. Um, Dr. Magdi, there is a question in Arabic that yeah, I request you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So there are two questions in Arabic. The first one is asking if the biological therapy for uh, psoriasis interfere, um, does it interfere with the uh, hemophilia? So this is a general question, I don't know. You know, the short answer is, to my knowledge, no. But, you know, psoriasis has many therapies, so I'm not sure if there's any specific one that may, but in general, we don't think that uh, any psoriasis treatment affects hemophilia yeah. and drugs. Yeah. Another question is, does the, if the patient with hemophilia needs a prophylactic dose of factor before a physiotherapy sessions? Uh, so Cesar, um, Cesar, yeah. Well, yes, uh, I think uh, it depends on the situation it, itself. If uh, the problem of the joint uh, or the targeted joint is uh, uh, stable, is not uh, causing a lot of repetitive bleeds, uh, then we can do physiotherapy without uh, uh, clotting factors. Uh, the, the major problem, what I usually do, uh, usually I recommend to take some clotting factors, especially at the first few sessions, because the body is not well adapted 
to the, to the treatment uh, or to the level of demand we are asking the body from. So uh, especially at the first session, we do you need some uh, small, even small dose if available of uh, clotting factors. But later on, when we have the ability, when the joints and muscles are adapted to uh, the demand uh, that we are asking from it, uh, the, uh, it's not uh, uh, an obligation to have a clotting factor. I can add some comment also on what said uh, César uh, for people who are on low dose prophylaxis. Uh, when they have physio, we try to adopt the session of physio when they need physio to adopt the session of physio during the day of prophylaxis. And I want again to emphasize this, but even if people receive low dose prophylaxis, physio is a part of a low dose prophylaxis and the treatment also of people with hemophilia. Okay, thank you. We're kind of reaching the end of our time. And there's a question that says, if we don't have thrombin generation assay, can we use D-dimer for follow-up? Um, I think uh, there are two very different things, you know, uh, D-dimer shows you actually the thrombin mediated clot that has already formed. So the two are quite different and one would not be able to use D-dimer to monitor hemostasis. Uh, there's a question, last one for Cesar. Do you think a physiotherapist without experience in hemophilia management can deal with hemophilia patients? <laughs> okay. Um, well, I answered this question uh, in written. Uh, yes. So I think uh, uh, a physiotherapist uh, uh, dealing with a patient with hemophilia is very delicate. So sometimes a physiotherapist uh, will be, uh, especially some physiotherapy technique uh, to regain the range of motion, will be aggressive dealing with the patient uh, that doesn't have hemophilia. When it comes to hemophilia, uh, we, we need to be working very delicately. We don't want to provoke any bleeds. Uh, so uh, I think a little bit of experience and knowledge uh, is, is very important uh, to, to, to deal uh, when, when working with a patient with hemophilia. Okay, great. Thank you, everybody. So this is now my uh, turn to close this uh, meeting by thanking, uh, first of all, uh, all the participants, uh, you know, it's, it's wonderful that so many of you could join and could remain so engaged. Of course, all the speakers who provided all the stimulation for all your questions and, and comments. Uh, before we close though, I'd like to also mention that the WFH is making very deliberate efforts this time towards, you know, what's called dissemination and implementation. So, you know, making these treatment guidelines not only available in its original format uh, of the text, but they're actually also having some audio, uh, you know, recordings by the authors. And I think that's the next slide that shows that you can access the narration that the lead authors are providing for all the chapters. And that kind of gives you uh, a summary and the important points in each of those chapters. I mean, you know, this has become a much uh, bigger document than what was last time. It was about uh, uh, 57 pages. This time it's almost 150 pages. So yeah, it is a long set of guidelines, but these, uh, these narrations uh, certainly will help you uh, identify the, the most important points in each of these chapters. And finally, uh, if, you know, what uh, we would like is really to you to note that this was made for the first time with involvement of patients and their families. Uh, each, each chapter section had a group of people that, in, that uh, in, uh, included at least 25% of them were either PWH or their caregivers. So this is something that has been, you know, created not just with healthcare professionals, but also with patient engagement. But most importantly, you know, these are not the final word and we need to continue to keep learning. So at least on the WFH website, this is a live document. If you generate data, if you have experience, if you have any information that questions or challenges these recommendations, and that's possible. 
then please feel free to write to the WFH. Uh, you know, Donna Coffin from the WFH coordinates uh, all the efforts towards uh, these treatment guidelines, and she will be the person to communicate with regarding any changes, modifications that you think should be made in these guidelines. These are live documents that will continue to evolve. So with that, I want to thank everybody once again and uh, wish you safety during these unusual times uh, and hand you back to our organizers in case they have anything further to say. Otherwise, good evening, everybody. <laughs>